is I went and got a glass of water and spilt it all over the table over there. I have never done that, but it was like, wow, that's a awakening morning. And then I put that little mic on here and I wore this sweatshirt. The reason I wore this cozy sweatshirt is because, first of all, I love it. But the real reason is that afterwards, Linda and I are going to our daughter's place and having a bonfire outside. So I'm just packed as much clothes on as I can because I do not like being cold, not unless I can actually stand in the bonfire, which kind of hurts a bit. But so I put the little mic thing up here and David said, Dad, move it more toward yourself. So I moved it toward myself and and I broke it. Thanks, Jim. He's going to fix it. So we tried tying it onto my strings here, and that didn't work either. So here we are holding a mic, old school, and it works, right? And this is a family weekend. So welcome, family. Welcome. It's just casual weekend here. Dan and Amy are suffering so roughly. I just feel my heart aches for them, the snow that they're having to put up with and the blizzard conditions as the sand whips across the beach. And so, yeah, bless them. We do have some announcements that I do need to do. Caleb and Robert, who else is down there that we, Seth and Ke Kevin Hogan. I missed him this morning. He wasn't there. It's like, where's Kevin? And they're down in Honduras. It's not quite a sandy beach, but they are working and blessing them. We want to bless them. Actually, let's pray for them right now. Lord, we just thank you for the group that's down in Honduras. We thank you for the ability to, um, to minister outside of our own area. Thank you for us being able to uh, go to places that are not like Perth and Lanark and Ottawa and the richness that we have here. Thank you that we get to see countries that really were struggle is struggle. And just thank you for this group that's there and that they're able to minister. We do pray blessing upon them. Thank you that they can get this copy roaster. Jim, it did make it. Jim, it made it. Yes, thank you that it made it and they're going to put it together. And we just, oh Lord, we bless the work of your hands. Thank you that a year ago we were praying for a place that we could as a church um, really focus in on and, and, and minister to. And thank you for Honduras is that answer. So bless them and the upcoming team as well. Just, it's wonderful, Lord. Thank you. Amen. We also want to keep praying for Dan's sister, Dominique, has been in the hospital. She's had some blood clots, and I believe she had surgery, but I don't know the outcome of that. We pray for Debbie Cameron, who is in the hospital as well, and she's home. But it's just always a realization how fragile these temples of clay really are. Um, the announcements, for those of you that know the routine, you know, if you don't pay attention to announcements, do you know what happens? Do you know what happens if you don't pay attention to announcements? If you don't read them, do you know what happens? You bring a shepherd's pie to the potluck where the youth are providing the chili. And you're the only one there with a shepherd's pie. And it just stands out like, why is there a shepherd's pie when we're having chili? That would be because I didn't read the announcements. I thought I did. I knew it said agape. And so I know how that works. Oh, no, you have to actually read those things to, learn, to know what's going on. For those of you that don't read, Tuesday evening we are having youth. In spite of it being the family weekend, we're having youth. Reader Christian Fellowship, grades 5 to 8 for the younger grades. And the senior youth, 9 to 12, is going to be downstairs here. Wednesday we will go for a prayer walk. I apologize. I apologize, Glenn. I chickened out on the roads. And I stayed at home Wednesday morning. I got as far as Almont. And I was picking up some donuts for Eiler's birthday party. And then I came back the Apple side road and I thought, oh my goodness, these new Toyotas, the back ends go like this. They're wonderful. But when you're on wet, icy roads and the wind blows you and you, and you go like this, it's like, Lord, I'm committed, but I'm just not that committed. So I turned around and went home. I didn't eat the donuts. I, I did go later on to Smith's Falls in Perth and a little bit later on when the roads were actually safe to travel. So my apologies, Glenn. Thank you for coming on your own. I believe you're the only one here. Thank you. I will be here this Wednesday. We will be here. Okay. Um, and then Wednesday, there's ladies Bible study that meets at 10. And there will be no Wednesday evening group this week with Dan and Amy being away. So we're continuing on in the book of Philippians. I'm really enjoying um, the style of teaching that Dan does here with uh, going through the word systematically. I've 
it's kind of newer for, for me to do that and been here for over three years now. And I really just love going through a book because you really understand it a way more when you go through it systematically as opposed to just doing various topics. So, so far we've gotten to uh, chapter one in Philippians and Dan ended last week at verse 11. So I want to read verses 12 to 19. And it says this, I'm reading out of the NLT. I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. It's true that some are preaching out of jealousy and rivalry, but others preach about Christ with pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. Those others do not have pure motives as they preach about Christ. They preach with selfish ambition, not not sincerely, intending to make my chains more painful to me. But that doesn't matter whether their motives are false or genuine. The message about Christ is being preached either way, so I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice, for I know that as you pray for me and the Spirit of Jesus Christ helps me, this will lead to my deliverance. And we'll stop there. One of the themes that Dan started to bring up is as the book of Philippians, it's so much about joy. It's, it's written, it's, he described it as a postcard. It's not a full epistle, it's not a full book. It's, a, it's like a little postcard. And as you look at the Apostle Paul and you just look at his life, a theme about him would be that he loves to pray and he prays for others. I don't know what, how you would describe yourself or have yourself described, but I love the description about somebody like him. What does he do? Well, you don't hear much about he did great miracles. He did all those sorts of things. But what he primarily did was he prayed. He prayed for the new churches. He prayed with joy, unceasing. Paul says in Corinthians, pray without ceasing. Wow. How do you do that? He found a way. And it's such an encouragement to us. So one of the prayers that is recorded, and it's a segment of a prayer, and I just wanted to pay attention to it this morning, was out of the segment that Dan read last week, and it's Philippians 1, verse 11, where Paul says to the Philippians, to the church of Philippi, and to us, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. And that just caught my attention. I know Dan spoke on it. The fruit of your salvation. What is that? What does it look like to you? What does it look like to me? Pardon me? Yeah, shiny fruit. It is a good shiny fruit, isn't it? That's exactly what it looks like. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Our righteous character in our lives brings praise and glory to God. So I was thinking about righteous character and the fruit of God's Spirit abiding in us and thinking how often I have been taught and I have taught and I have tried to do to change my character just on my own. So I will try not to be angry. I don't know if any of you, I won't look at your faces, but I bet all of you at one point said, I'm not going to get angry. Or like that plate of chocolate cookies that was just back there that's been completely devoured. I am not going to have chocolate today. It's gone. I thought I thought it was you kind of enjoying it, wasn't it? And so we know that there are things that we try not to do, but they're just irresistible. Or we try not to get angry and we just feel it seething up. And so we squish it back down. That's not the fruit of righteous character. Those are good efforts, applause. But the fruit of righteous character is allowing Jesus, the Spirit of God, to flow through us. As we're in those times, stopping and saying, Holy Spirit, what's going on? Why am I angry right now? Why am I reacting this way? It's allowing this agape love of Christ to live and flow through us. Agape 
does not make sense to the natural man. Agape only works by the Spirit of God. We learn to love as he loves. The righteous character is learned through walking humbly with God, not arrogantly. Dan said last week, he said that when you're under pressure, it determines how you really are. I love looking at this section that we're going to go into as seeing Paul under pressure and how he really is. It's one thing to say, I can cope, I can do this, all of this kind of stuff. But when you get under pressure, boy, does reality ever hit. And what happens when you're under pressure? So in Philippians 1, verse 12 that we just read, Paul begins by saying, and I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. <laughs> I, I look at this and I think, how can you be so positive? You're in prison. You're, you're planting these churches. If you look in the natural, it doesn't look like things are going well. And they weren't mega churches. They didn't have huge children programs with all this kind of stuff. They were small, struggling churches that at times there was infighting. At times there was stuff that was just going on that would, must have been discouraging to him as an apostle. But you'd never see that he's bitter or angry. As a matter of fact, he goes on and says, for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. And again, as I was reading this passage, I was stopped by everyone knows. I just want to ask a question, no guilt. But where you are, does everybody know about Christ? If, if not, how will they? And so how did Paul do it? How is it that the whole palace guard knows that he is there because of the sufferings of Christ, because he's in chains because of Christ? How do they all know that? Or did they just think, oh, he's just a Christian, we've just changed him up? No, there was something going on, and I, and I might be adding to it, but I believe it was, there's nothing greater than the consistent witness of somebody when they're under pressure to see what they're like. So there's Paul being watched the whole time. He's got prison guards. He's got people watching him. They're, they're seeing, they're hearing him. What's he like in the rough moments? So the question I take, I don't, I don't want to learn this for the life of Paul. I want to learn this for the life of Doug. And to encourage us as a church, what are you like in those moments? Where do you go to? Do you seek medication somewhere? Or can you stay in that moment and say, Christ be praised. I love you. You're above all this. My kingdom here is nothing compared to you. This is only just a blip in time. This suffering is so worth it for the greater glory of what you're doing. Can we look beyond ourselves enough to get out of the slump and the darkness and see? Now, I've seen people that go around, and I'm sorry, if you're sneezing and you have mucus coming out of your nose and you're coughing and you're telling me that I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I'm not sick, I just want to tell you that, yes, you are, yes, you are, yes, you are. Now, we can still pray that God heals you, but you are sick. And if you want to go around telling me you're not angry and you're just, <laughs> yes, you are, yes, you are, yes, you are. Those are just indications of what's going on internally. But when the pressure comes and you can honestly just say, Lord, search me, know my thoughts, like David prayed in the song. See if there'd be anything in me. The life and presence of Jesus, the living Christ, not the knowledge of the living Christ, the presence of Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit was in Paul, living through him. And that is an evident witness that they all saw. Paul could also see beyond. He says, there's a greater fruit that's coming in my circumstances. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and gladly speak God's message without fear. If you ever want to be encouraged, just hang around Gail for a minute when she's praying. No, nah, Gail, don't look away. You're not the slightest bit shy. 
Exactly. And not just Gail. But if you understand what I mean when I say that, if you want to be encouraged in prayer, hang around people that love to pray. If you want to be encouraged in evangelism, Devin, you blow my mind. You walk the streets and you pray out loud, fearless of anybody listening to you, crying out to the Lord for them. You inspire me. You encourage me. That's how it works. We inspire each other. We encourage each other by the works that we do. And then somebody else sees, wow, we can do this ourselves. This is how it works. So Paul's in prison. And he's saying, this is for the greater good, because those that were fearful in their faith are now boldly standing for Christ because of my chains. You never get a hint that he wants to get out of this situation. I have learned to be content in everything. That selfish Doug would want the escape button. Get me out of here. But I don't read that anything with Paul. In Corinthians, he says, I've learned to be riches and poor. I've learned to be in hunger and and full. I've learned to be content. And so we see that under pressure, the true life of what God's done in him is seen. Paul wrote in the book of Romans that all things work together for good. All things work together for good to those that love him and are called according to his purposes. Jesus warned us. And if you haven't been warned, let me tell you the words of Jesus. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. You will have tribulation. If you're surprised, why is it so rough? Because we're in a broken world. That's a mess. There's a better day coming. But right now, man, it's a mess. And you will have tribulation, especially if you stand up for Jesus. You're not going to be favor- like favorable. It's going to be like, how could you believe that? So Paul is in this situation in such pain and suffering, and he's overflowing with joy, praying for them and confident in God. Praying that they will grow in this confidence. It's worth the cost. And he ex- he's an example for that. Cheering us on. He goes on to say that some preach Christ out of jealousy and envy. Doesn't seem to be alarmed by that, does he? These people are actually are preaching for the sake of, they're not preaching for the sake of others hearing the gospel. I, I wanted to understand that a bit, so I looked up a commentary, and the essence behind it is that they were preaching because they wanted to stir up trouble so that Paul would not be able to continue on his message. So they're going around saying, yeah, Christ did this, Jesus did this, he does this, he does this. And it's to stir up the Romans because they had this uneasy relationship with the Jewish people that they were captive, the Jews that were captive to Rome. They had this uneasy relationship and anything that would stir up trouble is a, let's squelch it, let's squelch it, let's get rid of these Christians. So the intent was not to spread the gospel, the intent was to stir up trouble. But Paul says, thank God you're talking about Jesus because there's power. You talk about him all you want. It transforms lives no matter who is saying it. then he goes on to say, but others preach Christ out of pure motives. They preach because they love me, for they know I've been appointed to defend the good news. I was captured a bit by the whole thought. They preach because they love me. Dan's been talking the last couple weeks about agape love and how motivating that is. And when we know that we're loved, how we are spurred on. Paul loved well. He was harsh, but he loved well. And the Christians knew that they were loved by him. And out of that love and out of seeing Christ's love, when he says they loved me, it's not kind of like, yeah, I've got a whole fan club and they're just all doing it for me. No, it's because of Christ. It's because of what he's done and they're drawn to Christ in me. And so they want to be part of it. Bring it on. Bring it on. Let's go and share the good news. And I was reminded of Acts 9.15 where the Lord says to Ananias, after Saul has been had this encounter with, with the Lord, he says, Go, this man, meaning Paul, is my chosen instrument to carry on my name before the Gentiles and their kings before the people of Israel. 
what a contrast between those that are jealous and a contrast between those that love and are sharing out of love, pure motives. There's been some misquoting some credit given to Augustine and go into the world and preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Some people say he said it. Some people said he didn't. Some people use it as an excuse that we don't need to say anything. Oh, my goodness, we're given a mouth. Speak, declare, show. But I believe the greatest testimony is when you're under pressure and people watch you and they just see, do I see Christ? The greatest testimony really isn't with words. They help. But the greatest testimony is, are you at peace with Christ? Are you living your life as a disciple of Jesus? Have you allowed the Holy Spirit to fill you, transform you, making you like him? Loving someone is not easy. Agape is part of the process that God has chosen to use to transform us more and more into his likeness. I believe that as we learn how to love one another, talking even about praying for one another, as we pray, we learn how to love. As we learn how to love, we are transformed ourselves. It's not just that we love so that people know we're just, aren't they a loving, good group? Any group can do that. But we're talking about real life change. There we go. And real love doesn't run out. So Paul goes on in verse 18 and says, it doesn't matter what their motives are. The message of Christ is being preached. The Greek word for preached isn't some great preacher. It just means it's being announced. It's being proclaimed. People are talking about this message. And he says, either way, I rejoice. And I will continue to rejoice. Paul knew how to keep going on. Ephesians 5.20, which Paul also wrote, says, Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was consistently living out this fruit of his salvation, the righteous character produced in his life by Christ. Of all the passages I've read so far today, this one line stands out more than anything else. The righteous character of the righteous character produced in his life by Christ. I don't know what pressure is on you. I don't know what back of your mind if you hear the should have. And I, I I know we all do. And I regularly meet with people and I hear, well, I should have done this, and I da 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 da. And it's like Who's speaking right now? Is it God? I believe there's two clear voices that we have in our heads. One in the book of Revelation is described, the accuser of the brethren is the enemy, the devil himself. And he speaks discouragement and lies all the time. The unfortunate thing is it usually sounds like me, and I don't know it's anybody else. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly now. It's a matter of who do I believe? Do I believe that Jesus Christ, the living Christ, can make me righteous? I'm just going to step out just a little bit here. I won't say anything, but I'm involved in some quasi-ministry circles where I see this influence that concerns me hugely. And it was only this week I realized, why does it concern me so much? Because it's basically saying, if you are born that way, you are that way. And I'm not talking about gender right here. I'm talking about anything. Sorry, I'm not saying gender wrong. I mean, just people that you know what I'm saying there? I'm trying not to say it, but you know what I'm saying. I'm talking about people that just say, well, I'm, I'm an angry person. I'm Irish. No, you're a sinful person. And Irish people sin, and so do English people, and so do everybody. 
we use that as excuses or we use it as somebody's told me that it's okay to be that way. I have red hair so I can fire off. No, you can't. You can have red hair and not fire off. Why? Because of the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you hear the difference? I don't believe that God wants anybody to stay the same way they were when they entered into the kingdom, that a decade later they still look the same. You should be transformed and be being transformed into the likeness and image of Christ, period. And if you want, thank you, if you want to give up on that, you're believing the lie. And I just want to speak the truth. I looking at my wife. She's looking at me and she just scowled. It's like, I love that. She's got the best scowl. If you've never seen it, just, just get her some time to do it for you. It's probably one of the reasons why I fell in love with her. She scowls. <laughs> Not quite. It doesn't make the sound. When you met me 45 years ago, I'm not the same person, am I? No. And I say, praise God. I was such a jerk. Yes, I had hair. <laughs> Patricia came up to me today. I saw a picture in your Facebook with hair. Wow. <laughs> yes, we're all born with it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's not what I'm talking about. It is part of it, but it's not. I look at the selfish, sin-filled jerk that I was. And I see transformation occurring. How? Primarily through suffering. I love some of the worship songs that you did, Tabitha. It, it just leads along this whole idea that you don't cause pain because you don't like me. You bring me into difficult situations so that what's in me might be proven to me to those around me. It's not words that's the gospel. It's transformation by the power of the gospel. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Most of my early life, I thought it just meant I could go to heaven. And until now, I just had to try not to be the jerk that I was. Try not to sin. My whole focus was on me trying not to be. Instead of seeing the one who loves me and gave himself for me and his heart and desire is to transform me and make me into his likeness, not because I'm worthy, but because he has declared I'm worthy, worthy enough to die for. And my response, I love you. And in this exchange of agape, I am transformed so that I can begin to see you and others as his children, not as people that make me angry. I can pray through it and see. I can understand me. I'm not the same. I don't think I'm the same person I was a year ago. We're not the same going through this whole house situation. Why is it not easy? Because we need to go through this. What are you going to do? I have no idea but I trust the one that knows and you are all going to see God provide. Why? For his glory. It's all about the kingdom. It's not about us. It's not about my comfort. I grew up in St. Catharines. I most of the time don't miss it. Around this time of the year, I think, whew, <laughs> this is not a bad winter, but it's still winter and it's Ottawa. But one of the beauties of St. Catharines is it has this little area below the escarpment, primarily, that grows peach trees. You can grow peach trees. Beautiful soil, beautiful climate. The spring coolness off the lake keeps the buds from blossoming too early. So when a frost comes, they're not ready to blossom yet. So the spring delays the, the buds coming. In the fall, the moisture and the breeze off the lake keeps the frost away so the fruit can mature longer. It's a perfect climate for peaches. I love peaches. Whenever we can, we go down in August and we go to some family farm. Don't you love family farms? They're just, that's where real people are. 
and you see the guy and he's eating peaches and it's all drooled down the front of him. That's my man. Not these ones in purple paper. No, that's not a real peach. Somebody did something to that. It's in a basket with a man with peach dribble down the front. I want to buy your peaches. So why am I talking about peaches? Well, when I was a kid, we had three peach trees in our backyard. I loved it. My father was not a gardener. Oh, my goodness. He chopped them down. Dad. Well, they, they're hard to cut the grass around. <laughs> Don't grow grass. That's stupid. <laughs> peaches. But the reason I'm talking about peaches is I want to show you. A peach tree has very dense branches. And when it is loaded, Branches are bent down. Sometimes I have to go through and I prop them up to keep the branch straight. Do you want to bear fruit for Christ? It isn't easy. Blossoms are easy. They're the beauty. Oh, let's look at them. They're beautiful. We'll drive all around. We'll cut them, put them in a vase. Yeah, that's the good stuff. But the fruit, that's hard. And if you are going to allow Christ to produce fruit in your life, expect hardship. It's not easy, but that's the way the tree was designed. If it's just for blossoms, it doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't plant anything in my garden if it didn't produce any fruit. Well, sometimes I do it with flowers and cut them because they're nice. But fruit trees are meant to bear fruit. You and I are meant to bear fruit. Of what? Of busy people doing programs? No. We're meant to bear fruit of the living Christ in us so that those around us, no matter what prison we're in, they see Jesus. That's the gospel. That's the message. That's evangelism. I'm not saying don't speak. Speak. Pray. Proclaim. Declare but it's the internal life coming out that gives the most witness of God's Spirit within us. So I want to pray for us this morning. I want to pray that verse that Paul prayed as part of his prayer in verse 11. You can close your eyes. You can keep them open. I just want to pray this over us. May you always, always, always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. The righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. Always. And as you do so, know that you bring much glory and praise to God. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ, for this will bring much glory and praise to God. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to save us from our sins. Thank you, Jesus, that you went to the cross for each one of us, not so we would just have life evermore, but that we would have abundant life in you now that we would be vessels of your Holy Spirit. You, you sent us the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the living presence of God within us. You sent him to each one of us that knows you. Holy Spirit, may we fully welcome you in every area of our lives to let you reveal the living Christ, giving praise and honor and glory to you, our Father, God.
when the enemy comes with his lies, may we clearly recognize those lies, reject and refuse them. May we be founded on the truth of your word and your word alone. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are the living Christ. And here in 2024, whether or not in Perth region or Honduras or wherever we are, Florida, wherever we are, you are in us and can be seen in us by those around us. May we not, may we not hide our light under a bushel. But instead, may we be light set up on a hill proclaiming there is hope. There is life, there is power, there is freedom. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And you invite those that don't know you to follow you and find fullness of life. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for us being able to meet this morning. Love you. If you're visiting here with us this morning, we um, always end with a time of communion. So we encourage you that just while they're playing the worship, singing, just go back and get the, the cracker, the bread, the juice. Feel free to bring it back to your seat and we'll take part in this all together. Um, when we finish the worship song. So just enjoy what the Lord's been showing you. Thank him for this remembrance that we share. It's for those that know that he is your savior that we share this communion this morning. Thank you. I'm going off script and I don't like talking, <laughs> but the Lord has given me a song and this is not on the screen, but I think it's one that I should share. Um, I was really hoping this wasn't the time, but it goes really well with what Doug just shared. Um, the Psalms, sorry, the Psalms are to me, a beautiful picture of being in those hard and those real places uh, where David was so honest with the Lord about being broken and being shattered and having these burdens and having these hardships and being crushed and being weary and yet looking to Jesus. And I know for me, hearing, like knowing who Jesus is, is one thing, but Believing it is another thing. Knowing that Jesus is my hope and my refuge is one thing. But when I'm in that broken and shattered place, believing it is a whole different thing. So a few weeks ago, the Lord said, there's a new song. And I was like, okay, that's cool. And then um, Doug said, is there a new song? And I said, all I know is the word new song. But there's not really. And I think he might have even forgotten he said that. But it was confirmation to me that, that a new song was coming. And this song is called Be My New Song. I brought it just in case, but I really didn't want to sing it, but I'm going to sing it for you. Sorry, Gracie doesn't know it. <laughs> Broken and shattered in pieces all over the floor. I can't take the burden and pain anymore. Lord, you said your yoke is easy, Lord, you said your burden is light. Crushed and so weary, my soul and my body with grief lifts the sorrow. My heavy eyes are so weak, Lord, you said the weeping may last for the night. Lord, you said your morning will bring me the light of your joy. Lift me out of this place I'm in. Set me safe in your arms again. Give my feet a firm place to stand. Bring me light of your joy. Lift 
me out of this place right now. Set me safe in your arms again. Give my feet a firm place to stand. Sing me a new song. That you are close to those whose hearts are broken. That you save those whose spirits are crushed. That you deliver those who have troubles. Sing this new song. Be my new song. Go crushed and broken is all that I bring you. God, will you take it? God, will you take me nearer to you? Help me to trust you. Be my new song. Song that will bring me light of your joy. Lift me out of this place I'm in. Set me safe in your arms again. Give my feet a firm place to stand. Bring me light of your joy. Lift me out of this place I'm in. Set me safe in your arms again. Give my feet a firm place to stand. Sing me a new song. Yeah. 
great hymn to end that portion with. Thank you, Tabitha, for that song. I, I love her obedience. I didn't want to do it, but the Holy Spirit prompted me. That's the fruit of Christ in us. We just keep saying yes to whatever he wants, whatever he wants. Not my will, but thine be done, is what he modeled for us. And that's why he went to the cross for us. My sins they were many, but his mercy is more. Thank you, Lord, that you died for us on the cross, that you took all of our sins and you paid the price for them that we could never pay. You bore them upon yourself. Such agony, such pain. Your body was broken that we might be made whole. Thank you, Lord, for this remembrance this morning, the song and the word and taking this bread as we receive it together. We thank you. Amen. And for your blood that poured out for us that we might be washed whiter than snow. We thank you, Jesus. We receive this cup and we remember what you've done for us and thank you for it. Amen. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for how real your presence is. We say we're two or three gathered. In your, in your name, presence is known. You're in our midst. Lord, I really believe we sense your presence here this morning. Thank you that we can't make this happen on our own. We just come ready and open and prepared for you, and you come. You're so faithful. I just want to thank you for that, Lord, this morning. You're faithful to meet each one of us where we're at. You're enough. You're more than enough. Your grace is more. Thank you. Lord, I pray if there's anybody that doesn't know you yet, that this morning they will see you and desire you. Give their lives to you. There's life eternal. No one can compare to you. You're lovely. Thank you. May the rest of us be encouraged to continue to go on, living, producing the fruit of Christ in us, that all may see you and be drawn to you, not us, be drawn to you.
encourage us, Lord, to stay faithful in your word, in prayer and in joy, trusting you, allowing you to search our hearts, knowing that we belong to you, knowing that you called us to bear fruit, the fruit of your life in us, Lord. That's why we're here. May we always keep our priorities right until the day comes when we see you face to face. We don't need to keep it right. We'll be just so captured by you. You'll all be all that we see. Until that day, Lord, thank you. We remember you until that day when we will do this again in your heavenly kingdom. Beautiful. What hope that gives us, Lord. May we be encouraged and strengthened. In your name, Lord. Amen. We've got some time and I know.